The opinions and viewpoints expressed in .NET Rocks are not necessarily those of its sponsors or of Microsoft Corporation, its partners, or employees. .NET Rocks is a production of Franklin's Net, which is solely responsible for its content. Franklin's Net, training developers to work smarter. Down your Jeff Maciolix Hair Fan Club magazine and listen up. It's time for another stellar episode of .NET Rocks, the internet audio talk show for .NET developers with Carl Franklin and Rory Blythe. This is Jeff Maciolix here to announce show number 94 with guest Bernard Wong, recorded live Friday, December 17, 2004. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net. Training developers to work smarter and now offering hands on VBNet, ASPNet, and C Sharp classes online at www.franklins.net. Support is also provided by Code Magazine, Microsoft Technologies in depth for IT managers and developers online at www.code magazine.com. And now, the man who can't believe Rory is still sick must be the funky microphone, Carl Franklin. Yes, and out there in a state of congestion, it's my friend and partner, Rory Blythe. How are you doing, man? I'm good, you know. Got a little bit of a lingering disease, but I'm good, you know, good. That's good. You had a you had an uh, informative and busy week talking to people out there in Microsoft land? Yep. I uh, went to uh, Tacoma for Monday night and Tuesday, and then I headed up to Seattle. And then during the day in Seattle, I met with some uh, Microsofties. And then I met with my boss. And then on Thursday, I did a talk up in Seattle. And I got home late last night. And then I passed out from exhaustion. And then I woke up today, even though I didn't want to. But I felt obligated to because it was morning. And I thought, this is what you do. And then uh, I'm still tired. Oh, well. What else has been happening? Other than, you know, you're, what I hear else you're has getting been over happening? your cold. Um, I don't know what's been happening, I guess. Uh, I've been I've been working a lot. I've been on the road a lot. And I've been getting over my disease. And I'm looking forward now to a few weeks of not being on the road so that I can get caught up with little things like paying my rent, you know? Yeah. And, um, and paying other things and all that kind of stuff. I canceled my health insurance today. And that what? was really hard because they wouldn't acknowledge that I had a health insurance policy with them. Oh, I had to get transferred around between like five different departments before I managed to get this company to even admit that I was receiving health coverage from them. And um, then and then when they asked me why I was leaving, I just said, because I want to. And they didn't think that that was a very good reason. So we had to kind of, you know, argue about that for a little while. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? You know? I hear that happens so was, when systems are written in Java. <laughs> basically. Yeah, yeah but it was, it was pretty messed up. Yeah. But yeah, so aside from that, you know, that's life and things have been good. So what's up with you? Well, I've been teaching a class. You know, it's the same kind of stuff. I'm may- maybe getting a little boring hearing about our weeks every every week, but, you know, not much else. Uh, one really exciting thing happened to me this week, though, is that I finished, well, not finished, but I got working stably an application that we're using for uh, right now, actually, for your voice over IP that we're using with Mondays, um, a big improvement from the last one that we used, the last version. And I'm just having a lot of fun writing code. And... Um, it's it's you know system code, lots of threads and processes and interactions and and UI and really cool stuff and in audio and I love it. Anyway, Rory, I have some email. We have some mail. We got okay. Read it. Yeah. Okay. I will then. Oh, by the way, <laughs> by the way, before I read that, I got um, I got an email today from Jay Rocks. You know Jay Rocks. He he was the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 We you know Jay Rocks. <laughs> we did a show with him, and um. He says the following. So apparently there are a lot of people that listen to your show. Googling me produces a lot of hits on the J Rocks Rocks show and how people blogged about it. Apparently my cousin Googled me shortly before Thanksgiving and found the show. She then circulated this to my entire family and they sent Thanksgiving they spent Thanksgiving discussing how I had, I had acquired a fan club. In fact, I walked in the door for my sister's wedding a week after Thanksgiving, 
And there's the bride jumping up and down yelling, you've got a fan club, you've got a fan club. <laughs> a lot of people that have no idea what a string builder is now have listened to your show. I hope you have a wonderful holiday and I look forward to seeing you in the new year. Best, Jay. That was kind of cool. cool. Huh? So even even people who don't care about .NET one whit are listening to the show. And I personally feel sorry for them, actually. Yeah, I was thinking God help them, but oh well. All right. So anyway, this one uh, came from Rick Schott. And shall I read all his credentials? S-C-J-P, M-C-A-D, .NET, M-C-D-B-A, from Microfibers Incorporated. He says... Dear Carl, Rory, and crew, I am a fairly new .NET developer coming from Java to C Sharp, and I just started listening to your show. I must say that I am very impressed with the level of expertise that you bring to the show. I learn something new every time I tune in, and by tune in I mean download and listen in the car on my commute every day. It's so nice to listen to something that is not only funny, but a great asset technically to all .NET Rocks listeners. And it's even better, by the way. This is me just commenting when... The stuff that you learn is actually funny. Uh, I firmly believe your show makes me and all other listeners better developers. So Franklin's Nets motto is right on. You guys are truly training developers to work smarter. I would let, and I didn't pay him to say that. I would love to say that having some .NET swag would give me some ammo for the technical debates with my coworkers or make me feel much cooler than them. But the truth is, I am my poor company's only developer, so I probably just boost my inner geekhood and replace some of this old Java stuff I have laying around. Thanks and keep up the good work, Rick Shot. Rick, we will send you some swag, and maybe we'll send him some wearable swag because that was such a nice letter. How about a hoodie? Should we send him a hoodie, Roy? Okay. All right, Rick. Sure. Yeah. Like the Unabomber. Like the Unabomber hoodie. You got to get the glasses, you know. Keep your diary di- and cling on. And Rick, we of course, want- I bet half the people who listen to the show already keep their diaries and cling on, so that's probably <laughs> not tough. That's true. In fact, I just had some good gach this afternoon, so... What the hell is Gah? All right, you're not a Star Trekker. Jeff, what's no, Gah? No, what is it? I want to know. You don't have to keep me out of the loop. Jeff, you tell him. Jeff doesn't know either. I think it might be chocolate. No, it's not chocolate. It's like a worm dish. It's a delicacy. It's I a can't Klingon. remember. I, I used to know what Klingon for chocolate is, but I, I don't anymore. So, All right. I'm really, really disappointed in both you guys. <laughs> this is just getting weird. Let's move. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway... <laughs> Bernard is listening on the, with his phone muted going, what the <laughs> hell am I doing here, man? All right. Well, this came in from somebody who asked to keep his identity secret. So his name is Bob Dennis and he lives at four. Fo- no, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. Uh, yes. And I don't know why, but he said, please do not read my real name on the air. And it's not Bob Dennis. Anyway, all I'll say is he's from Canada. And this is a nice little poem for the holidays because, as you know, this is the last .NET Rock show of 2004, and we won't be back on the air until, what would it be, January 10th? So, uh, of, here's of 2005. A nice, of 2005. So here's a nice little holiday poem to wrap it up. "'Twas the night before deadline, and I have no idea where this came from except by mail. I, he may have written it. I don't know. "'Twas the night before deadline, and all through the shop, every developer knew the project was a flop. How could they not know? The signs were all there. The JRE changed three times. That's okay. We don't care. Then out of the blue, coming from afar, a new environment appears. The CLR. A standard. It's fast. Can we make the switch? We knew in a moment it would not be a bitch. The more we did, the faster we built. We shouted, thank God this is great, with no guilt. And so shelving the crap, we delivered a good build. It was faster, better, and wouldn't be killed. Down to the client we went with a leap and a bound. We hate that other shit. Look at this new language we found. They (laughs) spoke not a word, but agreed it was cool. What were we doing before? Wasting time like a fool. I got to work setting it up. Wow, that was quick. I'm in and out fast instead of looking like a dick. But we heard them exclaim (laughs) as we locked down the site, you Java guys are fired. Be out by tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that sweet? <clears throat> All right. Well, thanks, anonymous guy. Uh, one more, and then we'll get to Bernard. Dear Carl, Rory, and the gang. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, two more. I have just recently discovered your program, and I have become utterly addicted like crack. In my opinion, .NET Rocks is the crack of .NET programming. I just can't get enough of it. 
Uh, I just think that it is fantastic that I can actually hear all the authors that I've been reading over the years and put the sound of their voice to what I have read. It is really great to hear your interviews of the rock stars of programming. The reason that I am writing to you tonight is for help in answering a question I can't find a whole lot of information on. I was hired by a small private software company to create a web service for an existing application. The goal of this project is to be able to run the application from an EXE that would be accessed via a URL. We have reconfigured the app so that the security policies on the user's computer would not have to be changed. In other words, the application will run with Internet permission. What I cannot confirm is whether or not the application actually runs from the assemblies that are stored in the download cache. I understand that the framework, when starting an application from a URL, will compare the timestamps of the assemblies on the server to the timestamps of the assemblies in the download cache, and if the server version is newer, then it is downloaded. If not, then the assembly is run from the download cache. How do I confirm that the assembly is actually being run from the cache? When I examine the IIS logs, there appears to be many trips to the server for each of the assemblies. Are they actually being downloaded or just timestamp checked? I don't know. Greg Austin. Greg, well, first of all, I can tell you it's not the framework that's doing this. It's the browser. The browser mechanism uh, is already set up to cache files that it downloads and to uh, send the versions of those files along in the HTTP headers, and then the server will only send new files if, uh, if there are new versions on the server. So it has nothing to do with the framework, as I understand it, and a very easy way to check to see what version you're running is just to simply expose a method that returns your version, and, uh, you know, that'll be 50 bucks. <laughs> uh, Greg, there you go. Greg, we're going to send you a uh, .NET Rocks mug just for being a cool guy. I was listening to the latest. This is another one, by the way, from James Rowe Smith. Last one. Uh, unless Rory has anything to add to that last. No. All right. I was listening to the latest .NET Rocks show on Windows Server where they talked about 64-bit windows and addressable memory was discussed. It was said that 32-bit windows can address 4 gigs of memory, now that's 2 to the 32 divided by 1024 divided by 1024 divided by 1024, which equals 4. But they said that 64-bit windows can address a 16 terabyte address space. However, when I do the same calculation as above, I get this. 2 to the 64 divided by uh, 1024 to the 6 equals 16. That's not terabytes. That's exabytes. The sequence is byte kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte, exabyte, zettabyte. Now, what's right? The quoted terabytes or the calculated exabytes? James Rowe Smith. James, tell you the truth, uh, I have no freaking idea. But maybe Jeff does because he's sort of a, a math geek. Jeff, you have any ideas? I think that theoretically a 64-bit platform can address that much memory, but none of these chips have had their uh, memory controllers built to actually address a full 64-bit space, nor has the operating system. However, don't quote me on that. And, you know, the reality is, James, that, you know, the RAM ain't there anyhow. So, I mean, are you concerned that your 16-terabyte RAM stick is going to be outdated anytime soon? Um, you know, just curious. I guess we didn't really answer his question. Maybe Bernard knows the answer to that. But anyway... Uh, we thought we'd throw that question out there in case any other alert listener who's actually, you know, good with math, unlike us, can answer it. So if you are, send the answer to DNR at Franklin's, uh, not DNR, .NET Rocks at Franklin's Net, and we'll get to it uh, next time. Well, it's time to introduce our guest, Bernard Wong. He is currently Microsoft's developer community champion for the Southern California and Southwest districts of the United States, where he can often be found presenting developer seminars on various .NET technologies. He has created and delivered presentations at numerous developer conferences, trade shows, user groups, product briefings, and other events across North America. Oh, man, this, this uh, sentence goes on and on. Hang on a second. He has created and delivered presentations at numerous developer conferences, trade shows, user groups, product briefings, and other events across North America, Europe, and Asia during his career with the company. Prior to joining Microsoft, Bernard worked as a consulting engineer, programmer, and general music industry lackey, a role which he hopes to return to someday. In his spare time, he can be found programming a wide array of synthesizers and other electronic music instruments, both virtual and classic. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Mr. Bernard Wong. How are you, man? I'm all right. Are you scared? 
No, I'm just wondering what the heck is going on over there. <laughs> He's listening to this show going, I thought this was a tech show, man. So, Bernard, um, uh, what can I say, man? I last talked to you in Vegas at Dev Connections, right? That's right. And um, you uh, were putting together a fundamentals track for this next Dev Connections, which is going to be in the spring. Um, we did a we did a ad hoc fundamentals track at the last Dev Connections in Vegas, and uh, Shirley uh, assigned you to take over that task of doing it. So uh, it went really well. I remember Dan Appleman's talk on uh, Cryptography 101 just being absolutely packed. And, uh, you know, that was in the fundamentals track. So what do you think? You think it's going to be a, another repeat performance? Well, it was pretty obvious that there was a lot of demand for uh, information that came from those sessions. I remember numerous times I'd go and check how many people were sitting through them. And surprise, surprise, I was like, usually the room was pretty darn full, even for yours, Carl. Yeah, and that's amazing, you know. <laughs> and and people are sitting through them. As man. much as I tried to tell them not to come in, they just kept piling in. I don't know what's wrong. So yeah, it, so I think the concept was good. I think the the problem was with the execution, and and it seemed to have been, uh, you know, as you were suggest, suggesting, a uh, last minute affair. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was to um, take a, a different approach to organizing it. So one of the things that I wanted to do is to move the uh, workshop, which was a day-long workshop, and make that into the pre-conference. So we have Ken Getz, who's a notable authority, uh, someone that I've been doing these conferences with for over a decade now, if you can imagine that. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be taking uh, the attendees through a build a .NET application in just a single day uh, pre-conference workshop. So we'll do that on the Sunday. And then following that, on the Monday, which is run during the Microsoft Day, what we'll do is actually have a set of introductions to some of the 2005 technologies. And so we'll be bringing in uh, some of my and Rory count, uh, Rory's counterpart um, and some of the people that we work with um, over in the West Coast, and we'll be taking a look at things like um, Team System, of course, uh, the upcoming Patterns and Practices Enterprise Library, yeah. uh, some of these new Express products, et cetera. Cool. Following that, then we'll have an entire day which will cover uh, the essentials of .NET. And so this is where we've uh, got people like Dan Appleman um, providing their spin on object-oriented design and we'll have Dan providing uh, his take on what the top 10 most essential classes are available within the .NET base class library. So uh, hopefully this is going to be pretty useful for everyone. And then on the third day of breakout sessions, then we'll have a set of migration talks. And so we'll have uh, sessions that are specifically catered towards people who might be Visual Basic 6.0 developers that want to move over to C Sharp or perhaps um, their ASP.NET Classic or ASP Classic developers who now want to start building ASP.NET web applications. And then lastly, if that's not enough for all of these uh, fundamentals tracks attendees, then we'll have a post-conference workshop that will be presented by uh, Michelle LaRue Bustamante and Brian Noyes, and they'll go into some of the advanced concepts and uh, uh, practices that um, are going to be good for people to actually get out into the real world uh, building .NET applications. So what's a... Uh it sounds like it sounds like you're covering a lot of stuff that they're also talking about in the conference. I guess is the idea being a fundamentals track that you know they they take things a little bit slower and they explain things more uh, for for the newcomers or yeah, essentially it's it's not intended to be like a hold your hand type of thing, but essentially it's uh, intended for people who might have been too busy, might have been preoccupied, perhaps their company um, wasn't. Uh, yet prepared to take a look at .NET, and now with what's coming in uh, the Visual Studio 2005 and the 2.0 .NET framework, um, they're now ready to start uh, to take a look at that, and this will be a great means by which they can invest five days and get quickly caught up with everything that they'll need to know. Yeah, that's great. It's a great idea, and, you know, I thought it, I thought it was well-executed. 
in Vegas. I don't know what you think, but I thought it was well executed. But it certainly sounds like you're expanding, um, you know, the topics a lot to cover uh, more technologies than we were. I mean, we were pretty focused on, you know, fundamental programming stuff within the .NET frame, within, you know, the languages and, and that kind of stuff. And you're, you know, expanding it to include team services and and all sorts of great stuff. So it's actually – there's actually going to be a lot broader range of content, it sounds like, which is good. Yeah, it's been a really interesting exercise. Um, I know that you're an old pro at this, but up until now, I've only ever had to worry about my own sessions. Yeah. I've never had to think of it in terms of, you know, if I was an attendee or a potential attendee, right. uh, what what would it be that would interest me Um you know, for that particular market segment. Yeah. So it's interesting to put myself into their shoes Absolutely. and then start to think of what it is that would be interesting as topics. And the really fun part was to select who would be the best speakers uh, in the world to be able to present those particular topics. And so yeah. that that was really interesting. That is cool. So what what happened at Dev Connections other than that? I mean, I saw you only in the speakers lounge that one day. What else were you doing there? Um, essentially, I, along with some of the uh, developer evangelists that I work on the West Coast with here, uh, we uh, presented the .NET, um, you know, all of the, you know, groundwork uh, fundamentals of .NET in the day. And we did that on, on the Monday that all of the rest of the Microsoft presenters were all uh, touting the 2005 technology. So mm-hmm. it was kind of disappointing in that, you know, uh, obviously when you're going against you know, such popular um, sessions that, you know, you're going to be, you know, having everyone be, in, you know, rushing off to those other sessions instead. Yeah. So, you, whereas you know, programming that full day um, activity against all of these uh, 2005 talks, uh, you know, I think proved to be too much of a distraction. Um, you know, I, I thought that what we managed to do in terms of uh, you know, grabbing a chunk of the attendees, the overall number of attendees, and hanging on to most of them throughout the entire day was yeah. a pretty good accomplishment. Cool. Um, of course, coming out of that, uh, with this new assignment to organize the fundamentals track, uh, you know, this was something that pretty much preoccupied me. So I, right. I, I was planning on catching a lot more sessions than I actually got around to. And, and so this was why I spent most of the time, uh, you know, speaking with uh, some of the uh, other uh, uh, great speakers that were there in Las Vegas and trying to find from them uh, what they thought would be interesting to do for the next time in uh, yeah. Orlando in March. Yeah. Did, uh, did you get an, in, uh, a chance to interact with any of the attendees at all? Yeah, well, they, there there were a couple of times uh, where there were panel situations that were set up, uh, especially on that last uh, day of the show. Yeah, that uh, was fun. <laughs> once once it devolved so that I was the, the last Microsoft person standing uh, in the conference, and uh, it, you know, it was, it was my turn to start fielding all of the questions from people. Right. And and you were the one that was doing all the running around, right? Yeah, it's basically they had a room that was the size of a football field. And Rory and I and Rory and I were uh, walking around with microphones, and uh, only one of them worked essentially. So we were like, you know, people would you know raise their hand in one corner of the room, and then somebody on the other corner of the room would raise their hand, and me, you know, let's watch the fat guy run from one end of the room to the other. Okay, here we go. You know, come on, Carl. Everybody's waiting for me, so. Yeah, I felt a little it, bit it like was easy though, once you, you started yeah. ignoring those people, right? Because when I realized <laughs> how much walking I was going to have to do, I just sat down in one area <laughs> and I just let people sitting around me ask questions. Yeah, and I would I would volunteer them if they didn't have anything to say anyway, and it was a lot easier that way. A lot right. less walking. That's the service oriented, you know, businessman in me. You know, wanting wow. to please people. I guess that that keeps me from doing that. I I didn't even notice that Rory was still in the room then. <laughs> So uh what what are people what were people saying at Dev Connections where you uh you know were you were well, you talking it, about? It, it's w- one thing that always you know kind of surprises me and 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 I start to realize that perhaps it shouldn't but you know just over and over again you, you get the same uh questions and and it's you know sort of like the soft pitches right yeah. and and you know I I don't know whether they're you know trying to throw these same questions in, in just the vain hope that you know, all of a sudden they're going to get the one scoop where, 
You know, the Microsoft person says something, you know, different than all the right. other Microsoft people <laughs> through all of the other times right. um, have answered those exact same questions. It's like a test, but, right? A trial. Yeah, it's just sort of like, you know, it's like of, of all of the things that might be interesting to open up for discussion, then uh, we just keep getting the same ones. And I'm sure uh, even for you, Carl uh, and Rory, you must get these as well. Well, yeah, sure. Uh, I get I get a lot of questions all the time. And a lot of them, I can't tell you how many times I've answered. Yeah. I, I, don't ju- I don't just get the same questions. I'll get the same questions at the exact same time in the talk, you know? Yeah. Like 4.3 minutes into a particular talk, somebody will pop up and ask the exact same question, almost as though it were actually phrased the same way that it was phrased <laughs> Wow. Um, at, at a previous version of the talk. It's, it's almost eerie, you know? So some of, my, some, some of my favorites are like, you know, wh- which language should I program in? Visual oh, Basic yeah. or C Sharp. Right. <laughs> so you must get that a lot within your training classes, right? Yeah, and even on this show, believe it or not. What? <laughs> even on this show, believe it or not. Well, it, you mean there's an opportunity for people to, to phone in and ask questions here? Yeah, absolutely. People send email. I mean, They're you, asking you, questions in the chat room right now, or at least they've asked a couple. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and so some of them are asking, like, which, which language is better, Visual no, Basic or C Sharp? Well, all I'm saying is that we've had this talk you know, probably three or four times since we started the show, maybe even more than that, since we started .NET Rocks with different guests and with different people. And no matter how many times, you know, people, even in third parties, Microsoft people, me, Rory, any, even Jeff, for crying out loud, says, listen, you know, you pick a language because that's what you're good at, not because one is better than the other. No matter how many, we or still get emails. C Sharp. Right, we still get emails from people. Hey, I never said that. I said that C++ is the only real language and everything else sucks and managed code sucks. Get for the, the back room, <laughs> script kitty. You don't know anything. <laughs> God. Well, anyway, I still get emails saying, you know, Carl, we, we bit the bullet and moved to C Sharp and, you know, our, all, of, all of our VB6 developers got retrained in C Sharp because we think VB's going away or whatever they think. If yeah. you're curious, Bernard... um. Just your little comment there has started a language war in the chat room. Oh um, no! Because it, it, does, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. You know That's this, right. right? It doesn't That's matter right. what you're talking about. Like Bernard, the the object oriented programming module that we're doing for right. MSDN events right now. Okay. I have had the question so many times, even though it has nothing to do with the talk. So okay, I get how to do objects, but should I do them with C sharp instead? Yeah. I'm like, That's <laughs> not the point of the talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but right. of course, I say yes. But you know, I mean, that's not the point of the talk. <laughs> now, now, so. now what, one thing that I'd like to bring up is, is that as as amazing as it is that people bring up the same questions over and over again, what amazes me is when you get variations in those answers. <laughs> right? Oh yeah, and, sure. And so you know, it's like you as you just mentioned, right? You'll get some people that say, you know, it's like, oh. Well, Visual Basic, you know, .NET, it's going to be around for 2005, but after that, then it's toast because <laughs> yeah, everything's right. going to move over to C Sharp. I know. Right? And I then know. you'll get other conspiracy theorists that are all there saying that, you know, the C Sharp thing is just a fade. This is all just a way to get, you know, people secretly over from Java over into Visual Basic right. um, step by step. And... It's just amazing that, you know, it, it's like, you know, if, if I asked you, you know, it's like, who killed uh, JFK, what sort of answer would I get? Right, exactly. Uh, you know, and everybody's got to have their cause and, you know, their fight and their hero, and there you go. End of story. But anyway, what are the kinds of uh, questions? I mean, y- you wouldn't necessarily call that a stupid question, just a question that you've heard and answered to death, but... Do you get any other kind of inane questions that you just can't answer? Before we move on, l- let me let me bring up another point for discussion, and and that is one that we are just you know verging on uh, amidst all of that um, you know explosion of discussion right there, and and that was really what the you know personal emotional favorites or attachments that we have for languages, and this is where uh, you know as I say it's like it's a it's 
particularly interesting. It, it almost it starts off being an inane question that you're tired of, but you know through these variations and responses, then it does work its way into interesting paths. So as an example, <laughs> uh, this came up recently when I had dinner with a, a good friend of mine, Rocky Laka, who's yeah. uh, you know an author. Uh, one of the typical conference speakers that you run into everywhere. He's a rock star. Um, yep. You know, yeah, he's one of the proclaimed or self-proclaimed software legends, as the case may be. And one of the things that you know we were talking about over dinner was, uh, you know, the subject of languages. And the really interesting thing was is that where we started, you know, um, on the same path. You know, this, uh, the notion was all about, you know, fundamentally how different is Visual Basic from C Sharp now um, with uh, .NET. Mm. And we started from that, and things very quickly started to diverge in terms of opinions. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we started talking about all of the different languages that have or shortly will have implementations in .NET. And yeah. it's proliferated so much so right. that uh, one of Rocky's uh, co-workers at Magenic actually runs a website that lists all of the different languages uh, that uh, .NET versions are being created for. Last year, I saw a list with over 50 languages, and that was last year. I'm talking 2003. So if if you're interested, and for those of you who happen to have a uh, browser open, um, I think it's uh, .NET, languages.net. And if you can go there, um, and it's not even a comprehensive listing. There's there's even uh, Lisp implementations uh, for .NET that are being worked on. Um, you know, it's just insane. I think it's we like, should get know, a macro assembler for .NET. What do you, you think know, of that? That would be good. You know, I mean, we're talking APL people. Yeah. APL. Where are you going to find an APL keyboard? Or where are you going to find all the stickers to put on the APL keyboard? Yeah. I just think about that. So the the, the interesting thing, though, was is that as we were starting to discuss all of these, it quickly boiled down to the fact that Rocky was uh, mentioning and talking about how one of the things that he kind of liked to do in his um, you know, spare time is actually to create his own language. Sure. And I just thought it was like completely it hilarious. And it's just sort of like, why on earth, with all of the general programming languages that we have available already, right. why would you want to create yet another general purpose programming language? Right. I mean, have you ever thought about doing something like that? Only for a joke. Only for a joke? <laughs> just to mess around with the syntax? Yeah. Yeah. I thought about it just to see how it would be done. And I find it interesting in the same way that, I mean, think about Esperanto, right? You might say, well, why in the hell do we need another spoken language? But if you look at the problems that Esperanto solves, it's actually a pretty useful thing. It just turns out that people don't want to use it. But, I mean, it, it does solve a lot of problems, and it is a really good idea. And it does come along. One of the nice things about a new language, an invented language, is that you can invent it cruft-free, right? Right. So... C sharp, you know, carries over like, you know, curly braces and semicolons, which people who aren't familiar with them, you know, find very arcane. And VBNet brings over, you know, this verboseness, the if and if or if else otherwise do this, that, you know, and it gets kind of complicated for people who don't like to be that loquacious when they're coding, who don't want to write the Brothers Karamazov when they just want to do a hello world, right? <laughs> and you can, you could, uh, you could get rid of, you could eliminate all of those problems. By just starting over from scratch. It's just that so many people do start over from scratch. If you keep your eye on freshmeat.net or on slash dot, places <laughs> like that, you'll see that there's like a new language created every 9.2 right. seconds, you know, <laughs> and, and so that, that's a huge problem. But, but it is a good idea. If there were, you know, a way to standardize on just one particular language that solves all these problems, it, it would be cool, but I just, I don't see it happening. But yeah, yeah. so I don't think it's a silly idea at all. Well, hang on a second, though, and and this is where it does start to get interesting, right? And the point that I'm making is is that where you have specific requirements, okay, there, then sometimes there is the necessity for uh, creating a specific syntax for a language for that particular purpose. So as an example, let's consider Prolog, right? If you specifically wanted to have uh, a language where you are generating all of these rules that you are setting up for uh, an AI-like experience 
that you wanted to create, then you know it does make sense to have that you know have prologue um, as a basis for which to be able to create that in. What I'm talking about is is that the case of having a general purpose programming language. Right. Sure. I was just going to say that that is exactly what I was arguing about. I wasn't talking about a specific application to solve, you know, like Prolog where you're dealing with expert systems and things like that. I'm not talking about that at all. I am talking about a general purpose programming language in the same way that Esperanto is a general purpose, you know, spoken language. So please continue. Okay. <laughs> so what what I started to realize is that, I, or what my pet theory is, is that it's all a matter of, you know, having a boutique language, right? Yeah. So just as you know, one of the things that I like to that I like to see, um, you know, my personal pet things is that um, I like uh, distortion boxes, right? These are devices, <laughs> you know, that's going to change, a, a, you know, the tonality of an instrument into something else. And what I like is is that you know, while there are certain you know large manufacturers that you know deliver ninety percent of um, you know what the market wants. Then there are all these individual boutique manufacturers working in their basement uh, that generate, uh, you know, their own specific boutique distortion pedal devices. And you know, once a year they have a congregation uh, down in Anaheim, and so that you know, in the basement of the Anaheim Convention Center, you can meet all of these uh, boutique pedal manufacturers, and that's kind of cool. And there's a real geek factor to that. And Do you consider well, electroharmonics to be boutique or to be mainstream? Uh, Main Street. What the hell was that? Wait, all wait, about? wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Sorry, keep I have, going. I have, I have a real question for you here, Bernard. Because okay. are you saying it's just cool for a geek thing, or do you, would you like to see boutique language sort of esotericness introduced into business programming? Because I would argue totally against that. No, I, I'm just saying that for me, what I see this as being is, is that it's a matter of the expression of. Um, you know the 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 ego factor right. of you know creating your own language. Right? You wouldn't necessarily and, want to check in code in your own language that somebody else is going to have to maintain, though. Absolutely not. Yeah. Right. And that's that's what I'm saying is, yeah. is that when you know th there's even a book out there, um, and it was kind of interesting because when I wrote all of this up, I had that person contact me up, and and uh, I'll read. I'll read you something of, of what he wrote, but um, I had this in as part of as one of my blog entries, and I said, you know, it's like it's gotten to the point where you know I think it's an A press book where the person has actually gone ahead and written uh, a book that describes for people how to go about creating um, their own .NET language and compiler, and so it was, it was kind of interesting to me in, in that um, one of the things that he wrote back to me is is that. Uh, you know, he, he references back to what happened in, uh, you know, September 11th, uh, 2001. And the, the whole fact that uh, in, in terms of the discovery that, you know, there are, um, you know, these suspicious people that were taking flying lessons, and the whole idea behind it was that if, uh, if it was only possible for the FBI to be able to uh, be able to combine together a query where they could query against terrorist uh, suspects along with attending flight school, then we wouldn't have had the situation that <laughs> came up. True. And so what he was proposing was yeah. is that, you know, it's like um, it, it became obvious to him that, hey, if it was simple enough for somebody to go ahead and parse those two basic uh, phrases and then do a simple top-down recursive descent parser, um, then, you know, this would have been a situation that could have been completely avoided. And yeah. so he was talking about the self-empowerment um, that, you know, should have happened within the FBI. Now, can you possibly imagine yeah. having a typical <laughs> average FBI person writing a recursive going through parser. writing his own and creating his own language in order to be able to optimally um, do that um, recursive descent parser, looking through for those uh, the combination of both those phrases. Yeah, whoever suggested that's a total ass clown. Oh, can you say that? <laughs> what, ass clown? <laughs> can, that. Oh, can we say ass clown? I guess we can. <laughs> I, I, I. Do you, do you Just for the record, that? Bernard Wong did not say that of the person that wrote that <laughs> in. But um, thanks very much for that. <laughs> Well, somebody had to say something. I mean, come on. Recursive <laughs> parsing per your parameters? What the – man, jeez. Let's talk about fuzz boxes or something. <laughs> <laughs> I should have realized that. Of course, Carl, <laughs> you would jump in. So what did you do in the music business? And then we'll talk about programming again. 
<laughs> I I I was the, the general purpose uh, music lackey um, when and and I did just about everything. I did everything from guarding the dressing room door for Stevie Ray Vaughan and his band. Really, uh, listening to all of the that was going on in the back behind the door. To oh, I did everything. Wow. And and so you you're obviously a musician, a keyboard synth guy. Uh, one of one of my favorites is well, one of the nice things is that at, at a certain point in time, I started to realize that the music industry was a business. It right. wasn't all about music at all. In fact, there was very little about music. Yeah. And so, uh, rather than to slug it through for the art of music, then I thought, you know what? Let's just pitch in the towel and let's embark upon this engineering computer career. Yeah. And at some point in time, then um, I will return to this. <laughs> and so, yeah, here I are, remember saying that later, to myself too. <laughs> decades later, I, I, I now have, you know, friends who are CEOs of huge record labels with millions and millions of dollars and millions of hours of artist back catalog. And whenever I, you know, start to pitch ideas to him. Uh, it's kind of interesting that I'll get these, you know, responses back. It's like, come work for me. And it's like, and I'm gnashing my teeth at it. So, mm. wow. um, so that's, that's the music career, uh, that never was, or n- never c- came to fruition. I guess. I really, I really at some point decided that it was kind of pointless. Uh, you know, the stuff that I like is never in style and, and, you know, probably never will be again. And, and you know what? Who wants to be a freaking John Bon Jovi for crying out loud? I don't. So <laughs> you know, <laughs> and there's so probably the somebody is, in the is now. I have the ability to uh, go and and uh, twit around, and, and it's it's like programming, but it's programming for a different purpose. Yeah. Um, which I really find appealing and and of interest. And what purpose would that be? Just for um, fun. Uh, you know, that's just, you know, the ability to, you know, have you ever, have you ever written a chunk of code and and just really appreciated the pristine quality of that code? Yeah. Rory's using it now, as a matter of fact. (laughs) Is he? (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, to my mind, it's like one of the things, uh, do do you remember this, uh, uh, set of function libraries, um, known as Seaworthy? Seaworthy. No. Yeah, this goes back to the old DOS days. Yeah, I was there. I just didn't write in C. Okay, so so in back in the old days, um, you know, one of the most common user interface environments uh, uh, was uh, actually a set of routines that was created by this company, and, and they were known as Seaworthy. So if you actually go back to say the Novell Netware environment, this is the two point one oh. X days. Ooh. And all of those administration menus and screens oh, that they had. Freaking binary nightmares. Ah! All of that. So all of that user interface was created with Seaworthy. Huh. And the great thing about it was is that, you know, here was the, the commonality of the user interface, you know, the keystrokes that were available, the menuing system. So essentially it was providing some of the things that, uh, you know, Windows was providing, um, you know, concurrently. The really great thing was is that Seaworthy was also available in source code form. And the real beauty of it was is that when you could actually take a look at the uh, source code underlying all of that, it was just an incredible, pristine uh, expression that was placed into the code underlying it. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, that's that's the sort of uh, experience that, that I'm trying to reference here. Yeah, it's sort of the zen of... Uh programming absolutely here's another question for you now you work for microsoft but to look at you you don't really look like uh, your typical microsofty and you definitely carry yourself um differently than you know you not much into corporate culture and so you really have some great uh perspectives on what happens at microsoft what's it like to like you know sit inside i mean you've been in meetings with the big guys right oh yeah in code reviews and things like that, absolutely. What's it like being in a in a meeting with Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer, and and being Bernard Wong too? I mean, that's got to be kind of fun. Um, it, it can be. I mean, certainly, you want to be able to tone down your personality. 
Uh, so that it's, it's about what you're there to be talking about rather than, you know, what Bernard's, you know, peculiar peccadillos might happen to be. Um, so, you know, that's something, you know, that's just a, a totally different aspect of it. I mean, what oftentimes what you want to do is to avoid uh, attention. You want to be able to get your point made, but you don't want to unnecessarily draw attention towards yourself. So, hey, Rory, you're listening to this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I understood, what, you know, what the target was of some of this talk. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was not lost on me. The subtlety was not lost on me. Yay, though I may be a loud, boisterous, and, you know, sometimes just sort of unruly <laughs> chap, I, uh, I, I do understand. I can feel the slight little rub and the jab and the slow <laughs> twisting hey, of I don't the work tiny there. little knife in my side. I don't work there. You know, I'm just, you know, for your benefit, I wanted to make sure you could hear him, you know. So. Hear him? What, you mean like audio-wise? Yeah, I can hear him. Okay, let's get on with the talk. What were you saying, Bernard? Something really interesting. Uh, actually, I, I was going to do a sidetrack. Uh, one of the rumors that I heard was, was that didn't you accost um, uh, Steve Ballmer once and, and publicly ask you know, whether he was like a greedy bastard or something like that? Almost in those terms. I do believe that this would have been the telephone game. I never stopped Steve and asked him if he was a greedy bastard. I did at the XML DevCon get, in, get into, uh, or not the XML DevCon, but at the MVP Summit in April, get into an argument with him about uh, some stuff. But I'm pretty sure that we all signed NDAs. And I don't remember if I'm allowed to talk about that or not. No, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't okay. Think so. so the answer is no, that's just an evil pernicious rumor. <laughs> um, would you mind telling me where you heard about that, Bernard? <laughs> I actually do not know. Ah, uh, I can't remember. It was just <laughs> I cannot recall it this time. <laughs> just to be honest, though, it was it was along the lines of I can't believe that Microsoft hired him. You know, and then, and then somebody went into the you know the story about what what you said at this you know at this public conference or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So I, I said I, nothing. Was, of this I don't think it was Carl. It wasn't you, was no, it, Carl? No, you didn't tell me that. No. I would, well, I would never. Somebody not, else. But. I, I am a Rory cheerleader. I would never have said why should you have hired him. I actually, okay. think, I actually although think a lot of people inside the company did say that they were like, we can't hire this guy. Why would he? Why would we hire this guy? And I knew that would be the case, right? Yeah. When I was doing the interviews, I thought there's going to be some opposition, and rightly so. Yeah. If I were inside of Microsoft, I would be opposed to hiring me as well, just from the appearance, right? So <laughs> I can't blame him. Oh well. From the I, appearance, I think you're going to rise. Well, yeah, to the from top, the appearance. Man. I'm not really how I act on the show or how I write on my blog. I'm actually a very nice guy, and that doesn't really come across, right? So somebody who only knows me through the show or through the blog is going to say, wow, we can't hire that thing. That's actually very true. Very, very true. Well, I, 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 I can't comment. It, it's just the, the way it was described to me, it didn't sound like you were that nice when you were asking him those questions about why he felt he should be obligated to retain all those billions of dollars and, and you know, why what? he wasn't agreed no, back to or something. That, wow, that doesn't yeah. sound like um, I, said, I, said, I said no such thing. I said absolutely no such thing. I would actually be interested to speak with anybody who feels. I remember I what you told me thing. about the MVP summit, and that definitely wasn't it. No, you, you, yeah. uh, you, you asked him a question that was a legitimate, totally a legitimate question, and, yeah. um, and you argued with him about it, but yeah. you didn't attack him, no. And Rob Windsor out in the chat room says, what Rory said at the MVP summit was pretty tame. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, I, gee, I, so I we were talking. My... We were talking about being in a in a code review or uh, right. with with the guys. So it, it's kind of interesting because, as as I said, what you want to do is you want to, you know, deliver the information that you know is required of you, but you want to sort of fly under the radar screen, and it almost gets into a gallows humor sort of scenario. <laughs> uh, one of the uh, things that I did was uh, a, a competitive review. So these competitive reviews are organized uh, roughly in, in December, and so it's essentially, you know, all of the top executives in this, you know, large meeting room. And so for each of Microsoft's major competitors, you're supposed to prepare the materials, the backgrounds. So, you know, where, what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? What are the pluses, the minuses? Where are we in terms of our product strategies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, these competitors and uh, you know what the danger situations might be uh, that we critically need to be aware of. So the funny thing is, is that I was part of this small team, so there were probably about six of us that were uh, working on the content that would be presented during the course of 
uh, the half day or full day that it was. And it was interesting because at a certain point, as we got really close to having all of our presentation materials put together, then we started to uh, take a look closely and see where it was that, you know, we would, you know, boggle, uh, you know, get all bogged down and start to go seriously down a rat hole. And so it seemed like an ideal opportunity to kind of have uh, a pot put together. Mm. So we, you know, among the six or seven of us, what we did was we had, you know, three dollars, the equivalent mm. of three opportunities to place our one dollar bets on uh, which particular uh, one of our small group it was that was going to get toasted uh, by the uh, senior executives. Mm. And so it was kind of interesting uh, because it was like, you know, of course, you don't want to be the person that gets, you know, torn apart by the executives. And, but at the same time, you kind of want to win the bet. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. And so it was, it, it was, it was kind of grim humor. And, and the thing was, was that what you wanted to do was to try to get everyone to bet on you as being the person that gets, you know, seriously roasted. Yeah. Uh, and But at the same token, uh, you wanted to make sure that if, you know, things did boil down and, and the focus happened to be on you, that you'd be able to have the answers to be able to get yourself out of that situation <laughs> right. as well. So right. it's kind of interesting. And uh, the, the, the interesting thing was is that I did end up winning the pot among uh, the group of us. Wow. And and I managed to select the the one area that they happen to have like really roasted the uh, the particular individual. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it it does get very interesting. There are a lot of expletives, uh, far more so <laughs> in in the boardroom than what they would show on The Apprentice. Or even on .NET Rocks. Does yeah. Bill or, like to swear? Or even on the .NET Rocks before things start to roll. Now that I don't believe, but does Bill like to swear in meetings? Oh, I mean you've. <laughs> You've never seen a room full of adults, um, you know, go at it. I mean, it's really? worse than a locker room. Wow. And, you know, it'll, it'll, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a story about, uh, in just a bit about this. But one of the things that, you know, that really amazes me about this is, is that, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's like you, you think that there's a um, – you, you, you know, w- one of the things that you start to notice is that – there, there's there's different layers of executives, right? There are the right. people that really are at the top and are the big decision makers. Right. And then underneath them, you know, there's a group of wannabes, right? And so there's right. always a, you know, a group of wannabes that, you know, cluster around, <laughs> yeah. you know, in, you know, behind the skirts of, the you know, posse. whichever executive that they happen to fall under in the hierarchy of things. Yeah. And the really funny thing is, is that when, you know, sometimes you get these people in and they're sitting at the meetings and they pick up on all of this, you know, swearing thing. And so, you know, because they want to be the future aspiring, you know, executive, <laughs> but all of a sudden inside of their like little meetings and they can have like just, you know, little piddly meetings with, you know, product support <laughs> staff, right? And you just hear them exploding with all of these four letter words and everything. Uh, you know, just to increase their own self-importance, <laughs> e- ego and everything. It's just like preposterous, right? And, and that's where it comes from. So it's just sort of like hilarious when, you know, sometimes these executives will, you know, send out these email messages about corporate culture and what the corporate values happen to be, right? Yeah, right. And what it's just sort of like, be. you know, sometimes you, you, you read those mails and then you contrast that back to the meetings where you're face-to-face <laughs> with these people. Um, and, and it can yeah. be a real eye-opener. Wow. <laughs> that, that's really funny. <laughs> yeah, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you another sense. Uh, one one time I was doing a product review, and so the the other things that we do on an annual basis is where each of the product teams uh, has to go in front of again all the executives and you know present uh, where you are with you know, the current version of the product that you're developing, uh, where you are in terms of market penetration, where you are uh, vis-a-vis the direct competitors in that particular product era. And and I'll never forget, um, there was one particular situation, and essentially it was um, Bill throughout the afternoon just rocking back and forth in his chair and just (laughs) saying to, you know, the assembled uh, Windows uh, group, uh, saying, you guys are kissing away the business. Right. And he just said that over and over and over again. I mean, Mm. you know, just 
he just kept saying, you guys are kissing away the business. And there was another phrase that he kept saying, which um, <laughs> did have one of those four-letter expletives uh, incorporated within, and, and it, it was harsh enough so that I, I've actually banned it from my memory, so I can't even recall <laughs> it anymore. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and, and so between those two phrases, and I think perhaps one more, those were his comments. So every time we'd present something, it'd be like, you know, this is what the c- competition is doing, and then, you know, he'd like, you know, go off onto this, you know, these phrases that he would repeat like a mantra. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, somebody would say, well, what's your response to this? Mm-hmm. And, you know, then we'd have to discuss what our next versions are. And, mm-hmm. you know, and then someone would ask, well, when, is, when are you going to be able to complete this by? And then all of a sudden, once mm-hmm. we answered that question, then mm-hmm. around, another round of these, you know, this mantra would come back out of right. them. Right, right. Wow. Uh, and, and it was just that way throughout the entire afternoon. But the the good thing was is that um by by the end of the afternoon after he'd like, you know, completely, you know, kicked our butts and made us feel like, yep, the the, the entire doom of the company was going to rest upon our shoulders. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we sort of quickly turned around and, and, and did something about that and um and so we uh, decided that we were going to put out an interim product, uh, and and so myself and another program manager, uh, you know, we got locked inside of uh, my laboratory, and so we were given uh, an edict, and we were just told, you know, lock yourself in the lab, and you guys don't come out uh, until uh, you have three weeks to put together a, a product for us, and at that point, then we'll, you know, present the product to Jim Olson and we'll take a look at it from there. And um, it sounds like the code room. It, <laughs> I guess it was only it was, it was a, a three month period of time or yeah. a three week period of time. Uh, the, the interesting thing was, is that uh, myself and the other person, we, you know, we'd known each other for for. Uh, several years uh, we had met um, early on in our careers, and um, you know by the end of those three weeks we were ready to you know tear each other to shreds. I wow. mean, we're you know we're we're like that overworked and that frustrated with each other. But the the good thing is is that you know we've come out out, out of that experience. We've come out as you know I, I think we're probably each other's best friends uh, inside of the company, and uh, the product we. Uh, completed in in three weeks, and the really interesting thing is is that, um, and, and I'll, I'll bring up another story with us later on. But you know, one of the, one of the delights that I have in terms of my career is just you know watching uh, Jim Mulchin as he's you know taking a look at what we had built and just giggling to himself, <laughs> right? Just giggling to himself, enjoy at what you know he was seeing, and and. and you know, uh, you know, I talk yeah. about a, a lot about you know what the executives are like uh, behind you know uh, yeah. closed doors, and, yeah. and you know that's that's one of the memories that um, I'll never forget. Mm. Just... Hey, 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 Bernard. Yep. Do you want to do you want to take a kind of a uh, provocative question from the chat room? Um, sure. Um, you want to tell us what you think about um, or what MS thinks about Oracle getting PeopleSoft? Um, that's that's like one of those softballs, right? And so, um, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, okay, here's Oracle, Here and, you know, they got the company that they were chasing after. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think it requires any comment, you know, and, and, and this, this, you know, precision answer, Bernard. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, no comment on that one. <laughs> the, 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 the interesting, and, and this kind of gets back to what we're talking about as, as in terms of those softball questions that people always lob at you, thinking that suddenly you know you, you're going to give them some sort, um, you know, some radically different answer than everyone else, and that's sort of like the you know what I consider to be the armchair uh, CEO syndrome. Right. Armchair <laughs> CEO syndrome. Armchair CEO. Syndrome. Armchair CEO. <laughs> like people who think they know what to do better than Bill or. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, you must know. You, you must have these kind of discussions with people all I the mean, time. You know, you, you get these people, and, and it's sort of like you know, you meeting up with you know your college pals or whatever. I'm not totally not in the sport, so um, I can only. You all know, right, man. You and me. Look at this. But, you and me, man. Uh, We're band geeks, man. 
you know, the jocks, right? You know, it's like you, you can just imagine having all this, you know, the varsity jock crowd, and they're all like, you know, well, if I was the quarterback in that third down and eighty-five yards to go situation, you know, I would never have thrown it. I would have ran it, you know, or. <laughs> You know, passed it on to the next guy to run it, right. and so rather than you know that scenario in in the sports world, what you always get are the people that well, if I was in charge of Fox Pro, the way that I would make it into a massive <laughs> success, <laughs> right? And and, and you, you know, it's just they boil <laughs> everything down to one answer. They boil everything down to one simple answer. Forty two. Yeah. And what is your answer, Rory? Oh, 40, for how 42, we should man. feel about that stuff? Yeah. I don't know. It's 42. Come on. The answer is 42. So, yeah. I want to get, I don't know. I guess my instinct is to give an answer like good or bad <laughs> um, or okay. That's interesting. I, guess I feel, you know, okay. And the, the, the most interesting thing is, is that from what I find is that everybody has their own specific opinion. And oftentimes this is where it'll tie back. Isn't that crazy how people have their own opinions, Bernard? It's it's not (laughs) crazy that people have their own opinions, but what is hilarious is the fact that, you know, it's like they all have this overwhelming desire to play armchair CEO. It's kind of like talk shows. If I were Steve Ballmer, you know, and, and maybe that's what led to your questions. You know, it's like, Steve, what are you doing with all those billions of dollars? Do you deserve those billions of dollars? Why don't you? Those were my questions. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it! Those were. Oh well, that's that's the way that was re- it was it was told to me. So maybe it's gone through those permutations. <laughs> the telephone game, as we call it. Yes. Okay. So. Um, so, as I was saying, though, the the interesting thing is is that you have all of these people, and it's like, you know, well, if it was up to them, this is how they would, uh, you know, design Visual Studio so that it would, you know, make C Sharp, or this is the means by which we can make, you know, manage C++, the, you know, programming language of the masses, right? Yeah. This, is, this is what we should have, you know, given to all of those FBI agents in Arizona, and that would have alleviated... You know, 9-11. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. it, it reminds me of like stoner conversations, you know, where they're kind of sitting around and and uh, everybody's kind of looped and somebody just says, man, like, what if TV watched us, man? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, uh, well... <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to head down that, that path. That would be but, awesome, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to head down that path. But what what's amazing to me is when I have people who you know I think very highly of as developers, as architects. They seem like totally sane, reasonable, logical people. And I've gotten into conversations with them where suddenly you know it's gotten down into one of those emotional. Um, you know, quandaries, right? And suddenly it's like, you know, well, why can't I buy a computer without Windows pre-installed on it? You know, and it's just sort of like, it's like, you know, their fundamental liberties are at stake here. Um, (laughs) Yeah. They're not going to be able to go to Walmart and get soap for 99 cents anymore. You know, I mean, uh, you know, literally during the time of the DOJ trials, I mean, I'd be, you know, probably like the rest, you know, everybody else in the industry, I'd be reading the transcripts of what would be, you know, said, right? And the overwhelming impression that I had was, you know, it's like, on on the one hand, it was kind of cool. I mean, there's there's always a positive and a negative side to it, right? Sort of like, you know, that... you know, so like that that gallows humor uh, game, uh, you know, the lottery pot that that we're talking about, yeah. and it was just it was you know on the one hand it'd be kind of cool because you'd hear people testifying and and some of the things that were said and and then you'd be there and it's like oh wait a sec hey I remember that, that you know I was at that <laughs> meeting hey that was kind of cool right <laughs> and then on the other hand you know there comes a time when suddenly it's like you know you get this you know, email from whomever in LCA, and suddenly it's like, you have to, like, turn over all of, you know, the archived email in, you know, the folders that you have, (laughs) you know, between such and such a month and such and such a year and month. Yeah. 
And then it's like, it's a whole other ball game. And then you're just wondering, it's like, you know, gee, what if somebody sent me a personal or private email and, and you know, I didn't happen to delete it and, you know, it's stuck in there. And it's like, what on earth, you know, uh, you know, intern or somebody might be, you know, looking through all of this stuff. Somebody wants to know what the future of MSDN is. And I don't know what that means. Is there, is the, I don't is either. the future of MSDN question. in question or something or... Or Are we it, getting rid of it? Was it an open question? I don't know. What What is the future of MSDN? Uh, it, it's similar to our um, answer less precisely. Um, it, it's the same future as Visual Basic. All right. Next question. <laughs> uh, Randy Gibbon, what did you mean by that, actually? What, did I, what do I mean by that? No, no, no. I'm asking the guy in the chat room. Oh. What, uh, what did he mean by that? By his question. Yeah. We'll find out in a second. Well, the well, look. It, I, let me bring this up another way, um, or answer that question a different way. Uh, one of the things that that was immensely appealing to me uh, over the summer was an article that uh, was uh, written uh, and published as as an entry uh, in Joel on Software. Right. Um, Joel are you familiar with that? Sure. And so in this, fact, uh, Rory brought it up on the show, actually. Really? The article what, what, did Rory, what was Rory's take on it? Oh, wait, uh, on, which, on which one? Uh, this, this is an article that uh, was published in Joel on Software, um, yeah. How Microsoft Lost the API War. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so what was your take on it, Rory? I don't remember the specifics of the article. I remember not really agreeing with it and seeing and just making a lot of broad sort of sweeping conclusions that uh, I, j I just simply didn't agree with. Um, I wish that I had the article sitting in front of me because I'd, I'd give you some specifics, but uh, to, to, to narrow down, I just don't recall having agreed with it. So um, this, this was uh, written and, and publicized uh, during the summer. So it was before Rory uh, became an employee. Right. So it, it, it very quickly generated a whole firestorm of email, and it was really surprising. It was yet another case where, you know, in this case it happened to be some of my coworkers, um, so some of our teammates, Rory, uh, who normally you would think are reasonable, rational, logical, sensible people. And, you know, it's it pretty incredible that they would read this, or uh, I presume that they read it. Maybe they only read the first few paragraphs. And then they would comment it upon it as being, you know, you know, masterly insightful and, you know, mm. you know, spellbinding. And what... You know, and I actually took the time to read through, you know, all of its, I think, 20,000 word length. Um, mm. And I'm kind of suspicious that some of those people that were jumping on the bandwagon of this uh, article, you know, perhaps didn't read through it all. But mm. it, it, essentially, the, the take on it was is that, you know, first, you know, I thought, you know, here's this guy who's obviously intelligent. He's, you know, obviously able to, uh, you know, write very articulately. And what I really questioned was, the motives behind which he was writing this. And, it, you know, if for any of you who happen to have read it, you know, it started off with a, you know, real tension grabbing title, How Microsoft Lost the API War. Right? Yeah. And so with that, then, you know, he starts to talk about things. And one of the things that I thought was, was kind of deceptive about it was is that, you know, he'd start off by, you know, talking around things. So it, it really, you know, um, you know, they're, they're kind of like those softballs where, you know, it's like just, you, you know, you don't have to agree or disagree. It just, you know, you just follow along, you right. nod your head up and down on it. Yeah. And, you know, after a while, then you get so used to, you know, nodding your head up and down and agreeing with what he says that all of a sudden he starts to bring in all these other things that don't make sense. But by that time, you're already numbed into the nodding of your head so that you agree all the way through to the conclusion. And it was kind of interesting in that, uh, you know, what he basically talked about was how there are these two opposing, opposite, diametrically, uh, you know, opposing forces inside of Microsoft. And one of these, he happened to, you know, call this Raymond Chen camp. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this is at one extreme is Raymond Chen. And, and I won't get go into Raymond quite yet. And then on the other side of the um, uh, of the uh, diametric corner uh, would be the forces that he is assigned to MSDN magazine. Yeah. All right. And so 
you know, he, he talks about these two camps, and then he says, you know, hey, the great thing about Ray, you know, Raymond Chen is, is that, you know, here's this guy who's trying to, pre, you know, do everything that he can to uh, preserve backwards compatibility. So, you know, inside of the operating systems, if he finds that there are these old programs that don't run correctly because of programming mistakes that these third parties made, then what, the, what Raymond will do, Raymond and his team will do, is actually to put in these shims into the operating system system right. so that they find them and you know they say and they correct them yeah. so that there's specific code that checks and yeah. says you know hey if you're trying to run this you know dos application and you you know do a you know dos 61h call um you know then you know change that over into 51h call right. instead actually jeff richter when he was on the show talked about some some of those that are in windows still that target specific applications, and I think that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, if you're absolutely. Running, if you're running Space Wars version 2.9, you know, and you're loading it up and you get – yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, you know, that is something that we do to this day. You right. know, wherever we find that there are incompatibilities with software, I mean, first of all, we try and contact those uh, manufacturers and, you know, we – offer them, tell them exactly what it is that's broken in their application. But, um, you know, if, you know, sometimes, you know, they don't care about those applications because they're like several years old, you know, they're not going to issue an update for it. And even if they did, how are, how are you going to get those updates to those tens of millions of users that may have yeah. them? Yeah. So in that case, what we do is we specifically have checks inside the operating system, of, you know, to detect when those uh, applications start up yeah. uh, to invoke this, the uh, um, shim code that's in there now so that's that's the one extreme and so joel you know extols uh the raymond chen side of the camp and then on the other side of the camp he brings in the you know the authors of msdn magazine articles yeah. and as you're probably familiar carl you, you likely know that the majority of the writers you know for msdn magazine are not even microsoft employees right right i mean it's like yeah the you know, main editor is now a Microsoft employee, uh, but the authors of those and articles. And the magazine are, isn't a macro, Microsoft magazine either. It's a it's a partner. It company. is. It's a CMP magazine. Right. And so, I mean, the, you know, we we work with them, but it's a very uh, arm's length uh, right. operation um, from Microsoft. And the the times when there are articles that have a byline that is a Microsoft employee, well, sometimes I can tell you. Those articles aren't even written by those employees, but yeah. they're, you know, actually ghostwritten by, you know, third parties. Yeah. Hey, listen, uh, we're just about out of time, Bernard. Do you have any last-minute uh, calls to action or, or announcements or things that you want to tell people to do? Besides, obviously, go to msdnevents.com. Oh, man, you're Besides, cutting me off already? Yeah, it's only an hour show, man. All right. <laughs> uh, although you know, we, you should uh, you should come on Mondays and hang out with us there because uh, some of your your great stories and and philosophical positions might be actually really fun to make fun of. Okay, actually, can, can I can, can can I wrap up on on this whole Raymond Chen thing? Well, sure. So so the 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 whole thing is is that you know he sets up this you know uh, these two extremes, and the really funny thing is is that if if it really was true that, you know, these are the two camps at Microsoft, it'd be hilarious because right. Raymond Chen um, is is this guy who, uh, I swear to God, in the middle of summer, he will be the person wearing the ugly three-piece suit and tie. <laughs> okay? And, you know, it's like, I don't know of any Raymond Chen camp. I mean, there's, there's not a group of people that follow along behind Raymond Chen uh, wanting to be Raymond Chen. Okay. Right. I mean, it's like, <laughs> honestly, goodness, it's like, if you walked into, um, yeah. you know, into the cafeteria that, you know, is over in Building 26, or used to be over in 26, right. you'd see everybody else in t-shirts. It's a and, camp of one, uh, you is know, what you're cut saying. Cut off shorts and everything. And then when Raymond Chen walks into the cafeteria, you'll know who he is. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you're so, saying it's a camp of one. So I'm just saying that it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of interesting that, you know, right. this person has... You know this, uh, you know concocted, you know imagination of what he thinks is, you know this war of opposing forces at Microsoft that don't really right. exist. You know, there's the Raymond Chen, you know, single <laughs> solitary individual, and then 
you know, there are all these MSDN magazine authors who aren't even Microsoft people. Right. But yeah. just third parties. Right. And so that's my you. point. Uh, the only other wrap-up is, is that if uh, people are interested, uh, I publish a whole lot of listings about what's going on in Southern California and uh, some of the things that go on in the Southwest District. And they can find out about those from the MSDN Flash that gets published every other week. If you're not a subscriber, you can go to msdn.microsoft.com slash Flash and sign up for that uh, bi-weekly newsletter that goes out on email. Otherwise, um, Rory, along with myself and the rest of us uh, spread across the U.S., we deliver free developer seminars, and you can find out about what we're going to be covering from January through March and what cities will be taking these shows to at uh, www.msdnevents.com. And yeah. that about wraps it up. Apart from hey, Carl, can I add one more thing? Yeah. As long as we're talking about Joel Spolsky, um, for those of you who live in the Pacific Northwest, go to joelonsoftware.com. Joel is going to be hosting a nerd dinner up at uh, Crossroads in uh, near Redmond. And I'm going to be there, and a bunch of other people are going to be there, and it's really going to be awesome. So so just go check that out. All right. And, and maybe you can introduce him to Raymond Chen while you're at it. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, also, one more thing I'd like to say before we wrap up is uh, check out thecoderoom.com. The Code Room is a new series that uh, is being done by some people in conjunction with Microsoft, uh, which is sort of reality TV for nerds. And um, our old friend, my good friend, Russ Vestino, uh trained a group of developers at an MSDM events event, and then they took three of them. In a, put them in a room for a certain number of hours with a single laptop and a whiteboard and five hours worth of batteries or something like that. And uh, they had to develop an e-commerce website using no notes and only what they had seen in the presentation. And uh, so it's kind of fun. And that's all I want to say. It's thecoderoom.com. Rory, I guess that wraps it up for another show. Yeah. I know that you've got uh, something to do, so... Uh, that's not a good way to end. Yeah, I got to get out of here. <laughs> All right. So uh, on behalf of myself and uh, Jeff Maciolik and Rory Blythe out there in Portland, Oregon, Jeff in the chat room, Bernard Wong, and uh, no Kirk, no Richard. You know, what can we say? We're back to the basics here at .NET Rocks. Have a great week. Bye. And uh, we'll check you next time on .NET Rocks. Time, boy, life is hard.